Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me, Tiffany, and everyone at MMCA. Uh, as Tiffany mentioned, I am a curator at Cedalik Museum Amsterdam and also a newly a doctoral researcher at the Amsterdam School for Heritage, Memory, and Material Culture at the University of Amsterdam. And I just wanted to introduce very briefly what I do at the Stedelijk Museum because I'm coming from a practice-based background, so I don't really identify as an academic like Alex Albero or Lucy Stades. Um, I work making uh, temporary exhibitions at the Stedelijk and I also organize the permanent collection display and organize all of the acquisitions of contemporary art for the museum. I've been there for about seven years. Um, so I will talk to you today about my project after institutions. Uh, this is a brand new talk and very excited to share some kind of like thoughts and provocations with you. Uh, the project started as a group exhibition at the Stedelijk that was to be launched in October 2020. And of course that was right during the middle of the pandemic, so it was canceled. But initially, it was supposed to be a critical look at the state of cultural institutions, um, you know, and on the occasion of the museum's 125th anniversary. So, you know, kind of like the conference today, which is the 10th anniversary of the MMCA, this was supposed to be a critical, self-reflexive look back at the collection of the Stedelijk and also how it exists today, how this history has impacted its current state. Um, and to do that, I was really interested in looking back at institutional critique. And um, let me see. And even though institutional critique is a historical canon, I wanted to reflect on it for a few different reasons. One of it, one reason is because it's a pre-existing set of tools that we have to define our own interest industry. So also in its primary field of activity. And also I was just seeing a lot of different references to a kind of more historical canon of institutional critique within a new generation of artists and a really wide range of that. So artists working in the United States where I'm from, to artists throughout Europe, Latin America, and then the Middle East, also here in Korea in China and throughout the Pacific such as uh, New Zealand and Australia. And so this uh, kind of widespread of geography and also intergenerational play was very interesting to me. And um, I'm just going to state that institutional critique is not just artworks that are critical of institutions, but rather there's a really specific definition postulated by art historians. So I wanted to reconcile the historical canonical definition of institutional critique with contemporary practices that are critical of institutions but not necessarily institutional critique. So I'm going to give a brief definition of institutional critique and cliff notes on its waves. Um, I see three waves of institutional critique. Um, however, this historiography is you know, unique to me and not necessarily something that you know, I'm, I'm not trying to write art history here. I'll just add that as a caveat. Um, so institutional critique is a movement that began in the 1960s with the first wave that could be considered an offshoot of conceptual art. And if you talk to someone about institutional critique, this is exactly what they would probably think of. Artists like Michael Asher, Marcel Brothers, Daniel Buren, Hans Hacke, et cetera. And this is the image of Canast and McShine's uh, Museum as Muse exhibition that happened at MoMA in 1999. And um, to further define institutional critique, Benjamin Buclo, the art historian, writes that it was the desire of conceptual art to divorce art from the primacy of visual representation and how the paring down of representational material in the gallery that transformed into using the gallery or institution as a material itself. So to say that the, the, there's a reduction or paring down of representational material, to put it in very, very simple terms, would be to say um, 
to emphasize an idea or a concept behind a, an artwork and to divorce it from that it's re simply representing something. And so this also led to the critical reflection of the institution as a more metaphorical space and to emphasize less formal aspects and to example, think through the institution as a social space or a space that even could, for example, uphold state narratives. Um, so this is a, you know, the image here is that of Michael Asher's installation at Pomona College in 1970 in which he removes the door of the institution and then the aesthetic experience of this work is the light and the sounds and the smells that come in from the outside. Um, and so the term institutional critique was actually first used in a text written by Andrea Fraser in 2006. So this was many, many years, decades after the inception of this work in the 1960s. Um, so I won't read this for time, but um, you can read it on your own. Um, and this definition, um, Fraser really distinguishes institutional critique from conceptual art by emphasizing its social function. Um, so she's saying that institutional critique is not just a um, site or a site-specific practice, but rather one that has a social function thinking through um, the field of art, the institution of art as a social site and a structured set of relations that are also critically self-reflexive. Um, and that critical self-reflexivity refers specifically to an awareness of how art artworks operate in and out of the studio, in the market, and in the world at large, and how the, how the maker's responsibility dovetails within that. So I worked a lot with Frazier on this project, first um, as an artist that would have been in the exhibition, and then secondly as someone who I interviewed for my book and developed a relationship with her. And in my own personal conversations with Frazier, she really emphasized what she calls the anti-aesthetic strategy um, employed by institutional critique artists that to her is really the defining aspect of institutional critique. And it also problematizes a lot of different works of contemporary art um, being identified as institutional critique today. So to her, the anti-aesthetic strategy is simply an artwork that, again, resists the primacy of visual representation. It doesn't commodify itself easily. And this is really important to Frazier um, because works that easily commodify themselves would be contradictory in terms. So ultimately, a lot of these works are critiquing the co commodity status of the art object. Um, and if they were to easily commodify themselves, they would be embracing this kind of capitalist market system while simultaneously critiquing it. Um, so in terms of the second wave, it's critical, I think, to know that the second wave occurred during the 1980s and also coincided with the AIDS crisis. So I wrote my book after institutions during COVID, and so thinking through the second wave, um, this was a very interesting moment because they both coincide with a global scale health care or health crisis. Um, the second wave, I argue, is made up of artists such as Andrea Fraser, Zoe Leonard, Renee Green, Greg Bordovitz, Mark Dion, and their practices really focus on activism and refer to the agencies of the AIDS crisis, but simultaneously they oftentimes dug into the history of the institution um, and the function of the institution, not just the art museum, but also the natural history museum, the encyclopedic museum, um, such as this work by Mark Dion. Um, I really love this work. I don't know if I have time to go into it, but just quickly, this is the work called the Department of Marine, Identif the Marine Animal Identification of the City of New York. And he had gone through Chinatown and collected various specimens of uh, marine life, fish, crabs, and then would um, taxonomically identify them. So he's kind of poking fun at the idea that um, anyone can 
um, kind of conduct ta taxonomical research and kind of create their own taxom taxonomies. Um, so it's a kind of almost like a, a, a sense of a power struggle against who gets to be an institution, how is that power conveyed, et cetera. And all of these artists that I list, except for Fred Wilson, were included in James Meyer's exhibition, What Happened to the Institutional Critique, occurring at American Fine Arts in New York in 1993. And this is really the canonical exhibition of this wave. So he uses the example, um, in a, he, he also writes a very, very influential essay. It's a book-length essay. And he uses the examples of Byron Kim and Barbara Kruger as artists who do not employ the anti-aesthetic strategy. So these are works that were made during the 1993 uh, Whitney Biennial. And because it's the 20 year anniversary of that, oh gosh, it's the 30th year anniversary of that biennial, it was a very watershed moment in the history of um, you know, Western art history in which um, identity politics were kind of um, being introduced, but also very, very um, begrudgingly. And, and this was like the press reaction to this biennial was very, very negative. It was almost an object of inquiry itself. So, um, but within this, uh, James Meyer responds to Barbara Kruger and Byron Kim's work and um, he says that Byron Kim's work, you know, this is a, a work called Synecdoche in which he paints the skin tones of all of the different participants of the Whitney Biennial, I believe. Um, and essentially, James Meyer thinks that it's a bit too polite to have this kind of um, political, um, like any sort of political repercussion because it's so easily commodified into a market system. You know, they're essentially very nice monochromes. Um, and so he's asking, what does this actually do on a structural level? So um, these, this generation, they were oftentimes educators and activists and became more and more uh, dissatisfied with the formalism associated with the first wave of institutional critique. And I really love this quote by Greg Bordowitz on the rift between the first and second waves of institutional critique. I have no more questions about gallery walls. The kind of academic understanding I used to have about institutional critique led to a dead end. It, it, it ate its own tail and its formalism. What seems useful to me now is to go out and do work that is directly engaged, that is productive to produce work that enables people to see what they are doing, that enables them to criticize what they are doing, and moves on. Um, Borowitz himself is an artist, activist, and educator, and he was involved in Diva TV, which is an affinity group of ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. So again, this is a AIDS activist organization. And he, Diva TV utilized uh, video because it's so reproducible and distributable. So this is uh, stills from his magnum opus, Fast Trip, Long Drop, which was a documentary he made about his experience living with HIV. Um, the artist Zoe Leonard also in the second wave was also involved with Diva TV. Um, and I just wanted to share a couple works by Zoe Leonard because her, these works are just so different from what the first generation's work looks like. Um, the work on the left is Tree and Fence, or from a Tree and Fence series. And I, I see these as being quite metaphorical in the sense that she takes a, a lot of different pictures of trees that have grown into fences throughout New York City. And so I see them as a kind of metaphor of confinement, but also survival. And trophies on the left, this is a series that takes images of taxidermy within museums. And I think that she's using taxidermy or the taxidermied animal as a metaphor for the art object, which um, she would think kind of dies within the museum in the um, attempt to preserve it. 
uh, again, relating to taxidermy, is this work, Strange Fruit. Uh, this was made in 1992 after the death of her friend, the artist David Wojnarowicz. And these are fruit peels that are sewn together after their contents were eaten. Um, and so I see, again, this work as a metaphor for the body ravaged by AIDS and left behind by society. Um, and she had started this work by actually going through this grieving process of having something very manual to do every morning after she ate breakfast. Um, so even though this might not be seen as institutional critique, um, if you were to think of the first generation and these kind of more formal practices, um, I would say that the work critiques two institutional systems. Um, one, it challenges the preservation and collect collecting functions of the museum because of the work's ephemerality. There's no conservation intervention allowed into this work. And secondly, Leonard confronts the American medical system that failed those afflicted with AIDS, the lack of research, lack of funding available made by, you know, in the United States, the Federal Drug Administration. So a big part of this project is to ask whether Fraser's definition of institutional critique is still valid or does it need to be updated given that so much has changed um, in the 20 years since she defined institutional critique 20 years ago. Our economic and social and political realities are just completely different. So one, just some notes. One is that I noticed that the power of works employing an aesthetic strategy over an anti-aesthetic strategy um, are sometimes, or they're similar, but I could notice that those using an aesthetic strategy are oftentimes more legible for non-professional audiences, which I think is something that we really need to discuss from a practice standpoint. Do we want to make our field less of an ivory tower? Is that not important in terms of how we mediate artworks? Um, and if we're making, yeah, and then secondly, if we're thinking through the anti-aesthetic strategy today, I do wonder if there's a way to resist commodification, if this is the ultimate goal to create works that aren't easily commodified, aren't the works actually from the first wave quite commodifiable? And if you just look at the galleries that the first wave artists work with, um, you know, Fraser herself just recently had an exhibition at Marion Goodman. These are all very blue chip galleries in New York City that are very good at selling things. They're very good at making commodities out of, um, well, anything. Um, and I say that with the ultimate respect, thinking that you know, these, these artists do actually very much deserve to you know, make money from their practices. Um, and then thirdly, how the art object is created and which legacies it speaks to could actually originate outside of capitalist logic. So it could be the very act of inclusion in the museum that renders it a commodity as property. And this echoes uh, the, previous con uh, the previous presentation. So I'm gonna talk about this more in a little bit. Um, so in terms of the third wave, to postulate what a third wave can look like, you know, I would say that it's been theorized by just about every art historian working on this topic. So um, this is my version. Uh, to me, this is a shift in thinking from the second wave, of course, um, oftentimes enacted by younger artists, but not necessarily. A wave is a chron chronological structure, so these are certainly marked by time periods, the first occurring in the 60s and 70s, the second in the late 80s and early 90s, and then the third, which I would actually suggest happening after 2008 and the Great Recession. Um, I'm gonna go through just a couple works uh, which I think exemplify the third wave. Um, and this is dispersed throughout the world and concerning such issues as access, museum governance, uh, representation, equity, belonging, and 
also very much decolonization, just to name a few topics. Uh, this is the work by Clara Iani, which I discovered at the New Museum Triennial uh, from, I believe, last year. It was curated by Margot Norton and Jamila James. And for this work, she traces the commutes of all of the museum workers onto cartographic paper. And then in the wall text, you see who exactly, whose commute it was and what their job title is. And so you'll see that there's a very short line for the director's office and the management team, and then the people working more menial jobs or in the library or those workers who got paid less have much more longer lines. And so I find this really fascinating because, you know, this was amid the unionization of the new museum, yet this wouldn't really be considered institutional critique by Fraser's, Fraser's rubric because it is actually um, a frame drawing. So I'm, I'm trying to think, okay, but, but what does that mean? Also, yeah, does it need to be institutional critique in name? So the third wave that I'm postulating also expands institutional critique to a global context. And of course, every national context has unique social, political, and historical characteristics that impact institutional development, and thus the manifestation of institutional critique will be different for each nation. And I took a research trip uh, to Seoul here in uh, 2019, and around that time, the city's mayor had undertaken a cultural campaign that opened many public museums. So I had been used to working in the United States, in the Netherlands, where we're getting continued budget cuts um, and forced to work under uh, you know, austerity measures. So I was very, very surprised by this to see how institutional development has really kind of blossomed here in Korea. And during my research trip, uh, the artist Park Chan Kyung also had an exhibition of his work at M MMCA titled Gathering. So I think that it's interesting because Park's work itself shows how the infrastructure of museums outside the West has evolved with a different chronology than say, of European countries such as France or the Netherlands. Oftentimes outside the West, there are bursts of development, both public and private, in contrast to a more slow decline right now at the West. So Park's practice spans various fields. He's worked as an artist, an art critic, and filmmaker, and he was also a founding member of the influential project space, Art Space Pool. And his work has recently, or frequently reflected on Korean national identity, the division of the country, in modernity in relationship to folk, Korean folk religion and shamanism. His MMCA exhibition featured this really sprawling maze of white walls, um, and he's kind of mixing his own work with Korean artifacts, and then has these really interesting windows cut out of the walls. Um, and also video monitors are included into this. Um, and the exhibition responded to a lot of well-known man-made disasters like the Fukushima nuclear accident, the Korean Seawall Ferry um, um, disaster in, in 2014, which killed 304 people. And in light of the devastation of these disasters, Park suggests that the museum aids in a system-wide reflection on modernity. So in conversation with the Korean Herald, he says, I wanted to propose that museums are one of the few places left in the contemporary world where individuals can gather away from political, social, and economic interests. Um, I have to speed up a little bit. Um, this is a very incredible work by Park um, that was shown at Gathering in which he, it tells the story of the four people who died in a fire while building MMCA um, and the, the funerary ritual that was performed in order to help 
um, grieve these lost workers. Um, so again, this is uh, Park using the site of its exhibition as a lens to reflect on broader societal failures. And this kind of documentary video made within the con context of a contemporary art exhibition um, and that site specificity of it really rec resonates with Fraser's definition and also the activist strategies of the second generation, um, including so-called coalition building um, videos of Greg Bordowitz, these kind of like more activist videos. So um, I have to wrap up quite quickly, but I wanted to think through some issues around decolonization and institutional critique and of course, central to any conversation about the critique and evolution of institutions, um, particularly in the West, is decolonization. Um, and I just wanted to define this a little bit for myself and also for the audience about what I mean. So decolonial scholars see modernity as a very broad period that's characterized by Eurocentricism and anthropocentricism with the premise of the West and the premise of the human as the central figures in history. The present is assumed as the most advanced moment in history and there's a belief in the promise of the future. Um, so for the Stalix academic journal, Stalix Studies, I interviewed the decolonial scholar Rolando Vasquez um, and he wrapped up these thoughts in quite a clear way um, I won't read the quote for time, but as we all know, museums and colonization are really natural bedfellows. The museum was created to house colonial spoils, um, and it's very generous, it was forged by looted artifacts. You know, one can look at the history of the Louvre, and um, you'll see this. Um, and so, how can the museum ever be decolonized if colonization sits in its DNA? should we even try? And I would argue absolutely yes, because decolonial practice is rooted in learning and also recognizing one's positionality in the world. Um, it's not just the restitution of physical objects, but also about um, the fundamental decolonial practice of acknowledging your positionality of your practices by recognizing our position in relation to the modern and colonial divide. Um, I'm just going to skip along a little bit. I wanted to end with a little bit of a discussion about um, David Joslett's new book, Arts Properties. Um, and I'm going to define a couple terms and bring it back to my own research. So within his book, he expands on the framework of colonial dispossession within the art museum as a new way to think through the politics of inclusion and representation. And he writes that the museum is a site of inclusion through dispossession. So he uses the example of Native Americans who did not have the concept of land ownership before the colonial settling of their land in North America, yet European settlers ascribed ownership to Native Americans in order for them to be forced to sell their land. So they're invited into a system that favors those who created it in order to deprive them of their property. And once something becomes property, it becomes alienable. It can be divorced from its rightful owner. And this ranges from land rights to artworks such as the Benin bronzes or a contemporary painting. Um, so within the contemporary art context, there are repeated calls for historically represent representationally marginalized people to be represented in exhibitions and biennials, and rightfully so, but Joslett's thinking problematizes this notion of representation and inclusion. Representation consists of the image of something, and while representation is generally thought of to be positive in the art world context, it's also an aesthetic and political strategy. And within the context of government, representation is always a contradictory effort because the one-to-one -one total empirical representation of a people is an impossibility. So who's actually included in the representation of the people will, will inevitably be an arbitrary image. So you can also see this in the Oath of the Tennis Court 
um, that there's certainly no women or people of color in that, um, in that image. So bringing these ideas back to the museum, Joslet points to the museum as a site of montage uh, where various elements come together and within the context of an, an, an encyclopedic or world museum such as the Louvre or the Met, representation is a technique of dispossession through inclusion. So this means that the objects and artifacts that the museum houses were looted from their original context and are given the category of art only when they are ripped from their creators, made into property, and included in the museum. So how do we apply this to these thoughts to contemporary art where you know the creators are actually living? Um, first, we see a more complex reading of the desires to represent and to include as the simple invitation of representationally marginalized people isn't just fixed by including them. Rather, there's an exploitation risk and thus change is needed um, within a more structural scale within the institution. And this can be seen really in line with the third wave of institutional critique and also this kind of impetus for activism. And so where should we go from here? I wanted to close by wrapping up a few strands of thought and typing out, trying out some new provocations for solutions uh, facing contemporary institutions today, some um, which I'm calling these concepts. Um, yeah, in Arts Properties, Joslet actually um, <laughs> has this kind of strange theory of history in reverse or it kind of means getting rid of curatorial staff and making the museum an open archive um, directly usable by the populace. So he likens this to a search engine that gives the viewer agency through its activation. So he uses the Boymans von Bonigan depot that was recently opened um, as an example. And he also talks about documenta a bit and how the sheer experience of Documenta with all of its different archives and mind maps and um, ex exhibitions are just impossible to um, enter into as a complete exhibition experience. So within Documenta 15, he says, the idea of representation is undermined by suggesting that no single representation is adequate and that the viewer must take responsibility to produce a reading of the material on their own. So I find that really interesting because archives don't then thus represent, it's rather up to the viewer to draw representation out of the multiplicity of the archive. Um, I do think this is interesting, but as someone who spent a lot of time with this documenta, and I also very much love it, I wonder what the use value is of, of these archives for visitors. Uh, both professional and otherwise, because I find them very illegible. I also am thinking about applying that logic to participatory works, um, works that invite the viewer to produce their own experience in a different way. Um, one of the works that I really loved at Documenta 15 was Brazilian artist Graziela Kunsch's public daycare. And this was a fully public daycare for um, documents of 15 and this also generates experience um, and you can also say that this really uh, employs an anti-aesthetic strategy because this is quite difficult to commodify. I can't imagine really selling this concept. I mean of course it's possible um, but it also critiques an institution in the sense that it comments on the lack of access of affordable health care. Um, you know, as a new mother, I'm also experiencing this myself. Um, and thirdly, there are a lot of different artists making work about dispossession and the functions of the museum. Um, this is a work by the Maya, uh, Mayan artist Edgar Kallel. Um, this is a work that really resists ownership in the sense that he sold a custodianship to the Tate for 13 years. So they're not actually owning the work itself, but rather the ability to show it. So this is kind of a new concept that I know is very difficult for the Tate to deal with internally and administratively. 
Um, I'm quite out of time, <laughs> so I don't know if I can talk about this work by Cameron Rowland, um, but I think that this is a really important work to talk through in terms of thinking through um, his, you know, both property as content and methodology. Um, and so for this exhibition in 2020 at ICA, he um, looked toward the institution's building to consider the infrastructure of property and ownership. And the mahogany features that make up the building, like the doors and the uh, stairwell um, rails, um, actually originally were sourced from slave labor in the British colonies of Jamaica, Barbados, and Honduras. Um, and interestingly, the Crown still owns this building, so the ICA's tenancy actually generates money and rental income for the Crown. So Roland actually set up a um, company called Encumbrance, and it imposes limits on the, con the continued accumulation of rental income for the Crown. Um, Roland arranged a mortgage of these mahogany architectural features, including its doors and the staircase and handrails, um, and basically is planning on defaulting on the mortgage and depriving thus the crown of this revenue. Uh, this is shown as documents on the left here. And this Construction actually appropriates the 18th century practice of extending pre predatory loans um, to colonial subjects who would default um, and then be forced to sell their land um, as collateral. Um, yeah, this is, I was going to talk a little bit about the idea of private museums becoming a place for um, free speech in comparison to a lot of state institutions who have uh, gotten far-right governments, and this was, you know, something happening actually now uh, newly in the Netherlands with uh, the election of a far-right government. This is also something that's happening um, throughout Eastern Europe. I just was in Poland a couple weeks ago and heard a lot about that. Um, I'm also very curious how this relates to the context in um, Korea. Um, and the, yeah, of course, the fourth idea is that we just blow institutions up and start new ones or go back to the drawing board. This is an image of the poor Austrian motorcycle museum on fire. Um, but I would argue that um, for an evolution of the museum to a more equitable standard rather than the complete uh, abolition. Um, and with any thoughts, especially about how this research relates to your own work um, as artists or researchers, you're always welcome to email me. Thank you. <laughs>